Um, my name is Dr. Carol Palmer. I am the director of the Council for British Research in the Levant, CBRL, and welcome to this um, webinar on Ramla, Palestine's forgotten, pa forgotten capital. Um, we run um, a series of webinars in CBRL and I can see some, 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 uh, some familiar faces, some familiar names joining us and also some, some new people. So welcome everybody to this uh, CBRL webinar. We still have a few people joining us. I'm just going to take a moment to introduce CBRL. Most of you, I think, will be very familiar with us. Um, we are um, a, a, a learned society. Um, we are one of the British um, International Research Institutes affiliated with the British Academy in London. We uh, have a long history in the Levant region, starting with the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem. We currently run as a UK independent charity and membership organization. We have two institutes in the region, one in Amman, Jordan, where I'm speaking uh, today, from where I'm speaking today. And our other institute is the Kenyan Institute in Jerusalem, formerly known as the British School of Archaeology. Um, we also have an office in London at the British Academy, and we're very pleased to be able to present today uh, this uh, lecture and uh, discussion session given by Professor Andrew Peterson from um, the University of Wales Trinity St David. And um, Andrew's association with the, the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem, the BSAJ and CBRL is a very long and distinguished one. And he will tell you a little bit more about how the survey uh, started that he's reporting on today, as well as the recently published um, book. And then we are very pleased to have joining with us two discussants, uh, Dr. Richard Clary, um, from uh, who's currently uh, a senior lecturer in Islamic art and architecture at the University of York. Um, and then we will also be, we also have with us today, I'm very pleased to say, Dr. Maha Abu Munshar, who's actually based in Qatar. So we cover today the UK, Jordan and Qatar. So I just, uh, I think I should say just a little bit more about our speakers to give um, to give them introductions before we start. So Professor Andrew Peterson, as I mentioned, is uh, Director of Research in Islamic Archaeology at the University of Wales Trinity St David. He um, studied medieval history and archaeology at St Andrews, did his PhD at Cardiff University, um, concentrated on the development of urban centers in medieval and Ottoman Palestine. But since that time, he's worked um, all across the Middle East, including in Jordan, Iraq, Palestine, Turkmenistan, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, Syria, Qatar, Kenya, and Tanzania. Um, and so his speciality is really standing buildings, and that's what he will um, speak to us about. And as I mentioned, he has a long history also with our organization. Dr. Richard McClary has a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, and he is currently a senior lecturer in Islamic art and architecture at the University of York, and the research director of the British Institute of Persian Studies, one of the other British international research institutes. His research focuses primarily on medieval Islamic architecture from Anatolia to Central Asia and on Iranian overglazed ceramics from the 12th to 14th centuries. Um, we can, there is more sort of about his publications uh, in, in, the, in the advertisements for all of our speakers today. Dr. Maha Abu Manshar completed his PhD in Islamic history at Dundee in the UK and is currently Associate Professor of Islamic History at Qatar University. 
Previously, he was a visiting senior lecturer to the Department of Islamic History and Civilization at the University of Malaya, Malaysia. And before that, he worked at the Al Maktoum University Institute, sorry, at the University of Aberdeen from 2003 to 2009. So his teaching and research lies in the areas of Islamic history with a special interest in the history of Jerusalem and the history of Muslim Christian relations and the Crusades, the Crusaders. Um, all of our speakers have um, very long and distinguished publication records. So I think uh, with, with that, I'm going to hand over to Professor Andrew Peterson to give his overview of all the, the work that he and colleagues have, um, have done at, on Ramla. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Carol, for the introduction. And um, I, I, I'm very, very pleased to, to have this opportunity to talk about uh, the Ramla project. And I'm very pleased that we have, um, that the CBRL has, has decided to, to to really publicize this 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 pro project which is although perhaps uh, uh, people may not have heard of it it's actually been a project which has been ongoing with the um cbrl for many years um uh and so uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about it and i'd also like to thank richard mcclary and maha for um, acting as discussants in this in this uh, in this webinar, uh, because I think they'll both add, they're both kind of um, uh, have expertise which is relevant to um, uh, to this project, this this publication. Uh, Richard McClary's um, expertise in Islamic architecture um, will hopefully be able to. Uh, provide um, a different perspective on the um, on the architecture of Ramla and Maha is actually he's actually within he's actually uh, one of the authors of this publication but he's also got particular expertise in as, as, as you know in Palestine but also in uh, in the, the history and he's also dealt with two um, he's translated and worked on two um, two Arabic documents directly related to uh, Ramla. So he might be able, he might mention those later on. Um, but first, by way of introduction, I should say that the Ramla project um, kind of grew out of the, um, the Mamluk Jerusalem project, which uh, some of you may be aware of, which is a, a project which was uh, begun uh, by Kathleen Kenyon, uh, really in response to um, the uh, difficult situations in, in Jerusalem after the um, after the Israeli um, sort of conquest of, of, of Jerusalem, and the, and the fact that the working within the British school was. Uh, it was actually quite difficult to do any excavations and so the idea was to dock to really investigate the architecture the historic architecture of Jerusalem and focus on something for which Jerusalem is very famous it's 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 Mamluk architecture uh and um yeah so and I'll just share my screen now um and this will stop other screen sharing. Yes. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay. Sorry about this. Um, so um, here's the uh, uh, slide here from the beginning. Okay. So um, yeah. So the project um, of Mamluk Jerusalem was a, a, a major initiative and is funded by, amongst others, the World of Islam Festival Trust. And this this documented the immense, immensely important uh, and uh, 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 medieval architecture of, of, of Jerusalem. And uh, two two uh, two individuals who are particularly prominent within this were uh, Michael Burgoyne and, and Donald Richards. 
uh, uh, Donald Richards was a, um, a very uh, famous uh, historian of the medieval Islamic period, Mamluk period, and he wrote a lot about the uh, the Mamluks and both in Egypt and um, and within Palestine, and he really provided the historical context for the uh, for Mamluk Jerusalem. And as many of you may know, Michael Burgoyne was also the he's an architect, um, but he was the the, uh, the chief author of the book on uh, the, the, the this major book on Mamluk Jerusalem. And both both Michael and Donald uh, uh, during the course of their work on um, on Jerusalem uh, also became aware of uh, the significance of, of Ramla, the city of Ramla. So, I'm still, so yeah, so um, both Donald Richards and Michael Burgoyne, the, the, some, the, the key authors really of the um, Mamluk Jerusalem volume, which is a major, has major significance in preserving much of the old city of Jerusalem. They became aware of Ramla and and how important Ramla was for, in architectural and historical terms for understanding uh, uh, Palestine. And um, so they both had, uh, pushed quite hard to have a, a project started on Ramla. Um, this actually took quite a long time to get going and it wasn't didn't really start formally until uh, 1995 so that this is the, the beginning of the project um, but as you may okay so that's that's the, the background so the Ramla project started in 1995 and um, for a variety of reasons some of which I'll mention the, the the final report on the project only appeared last year in 2021 so it took extraordinarily long time to get uh, to become published um, and this was for a variety of reasons part one of these is um, the original project was a project of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem which uh, later amalgamated with the Council CBRL, Council for British Research in the Levant. And due to lots of administrative changes, um, Ramla sort of, uh, uh, it, as a project, it, it dropped in importance uh, because of the, the, the complexities of the, the merger and also because of um, problems within Israel and Palestine as well. So that's just kind of a, a basic background uh, to, to the evolution of the project. Um, now, uh, if we look at the first picture, this, uh, this is just uh, the, the front cover of the, of the book, which just appeared just last year. So I should also mention that the book is uh, jointly edited by myself and Dennis Pringle. Dennis Pringle is, as again, as many of you may know, is a very prominent um, and also he's a, also a historian, also based in, uh, he's based in Cardiff. And um, he was also one of the people pushing for this project in the first place. Now, uh, I'd uh, I'll just introduce you briefly to some of the some of the the, the the chapters within the book, just to give you kind of an, an over overview, and also really to introduce you to the authors. So the authors of this uh, of the chapters are, are there in yellow. So we've got Robert Hoyland, uh, um, Donald Richards, Peter Edbury, Matthew Ellett, Benjamin Kadar. So lots of very famous and important historians, archaeologists, uh, specialising in the sort of medieval period. So we're very fortunate, really, to assemble this group of, um, of scholars to work on Ramla. And I think one of, one of the benefits of the project having taken so long to to finally come together in a book is that we've been able to get really the best people to contribute to this. So they're all all really the, the top experts in this. And they, they've made a, a, a much better book than you could have if it had been just produced over a, over a, um, a shorter period. Um, unfortunately, two, two of the authors um, didn't uh, 
did actually manage to see the book uh, published, but um, unfortunately died before be, uh, well, before this webinar, but at least they managed to see it out. Um, so, but we, we're very lucky that all these people contributed their time and their expertise. And also it was a, an immensely complex editing process as well. Um, because one of the problems with the uh, publication project like this over many years is that new data emerges and we have a time so um so for example um so for example we had um um a lot of new inscriptions added to Mehmed to Tunju's uh, uh section on the Arabic inscriptions from Ramla so we've actually got some previously unpublished inscriptions and this really is the only corpus of inscriptions from Ramla, which I should say the inscriptions are very important and they include some of the earliest waqf or um, uh, foundation uh, inscriptions for charitable institutions, so some of the first in the Islamic world, so very, very important material from this. So cumulatively this book does contain some extremely um, useful and important information relevant not only to Ramla but also to um, to the wider Islamic world and Middle East. Okay now um, I've said all this and I haven't really yet said too much about the city of Ramla and I'm going to start by coming at this from a slightly uh, odd angle by talking about um, another book and this is a book which was uh, published I think it was in the um, I think it was published in uh, uh, 1998, I think, I'm just by Sandy Tolan. And um, I'm sorry, it was first published in 2006. So Lemon Tree by Sandy Tolan is a story of, um, it really is a story of, um, uh, it's kind of the creation of Israel and uh, both the pain and the, the pain and the joy it's caused to some people and so and really the complexities of, of, of any work uh, which deals with sort of the heritage of the region but interestingly Sandy Tolan's work uh, focuses on, on two families who um, uh, who both owned a house in Ramla. And so some, the, the Lemon Tree is one of the few books which really goes into a lot of detail describing how um, the city of Ramla changed from uh, being um, uh, uh, a part of, an Arab city, part of Mandate Palestine, to a city which is today uh, prominently a Jewish city. And it, it's kind of a microcosm of, of change in the, in the Middle East, especially within Israel. And just in relation to that, I should say that also within, within our own publication, it's, it's quite noticeable that we've included Israelis, Palestinians, Europeans, sort of ba basically anybody's an expert. And I think one of the, one of the nice things about working on Ramla is, is whatever background you're from, all, there's a lot of enthusiasm for they're really bringing out the history and heritage of this this very unusual city. But um, so um, the transition which happened in 1948 um, uh, took place when Ramla was captured by the um, by the Jewish forces, and this is just a photograph uh, taken at the time when you see. Um, the uh, Arab or Palestinian inhabitants of Ramla uh, being moved out of the city. And uh, Sandy Tolan's book um, contains a sort of like very detailed description of this. And I'll just give you a little bit of this just to give you an idea of the feeling of, 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 of the immensity of what happened. So he says, the morning of July the 14th was cloudless and extremely hot. It was the middle of July, the seventh day of Ramadan. Thousands of people had already been expelled from our Ramla by bus and truck. 
Some, like Bashir and his siblings, had left well before the Jewish soldiers arrived, taking temporary refuge in Ramallah. Others in the Kheri clan had remained in Ramla. Ferdus and her cousins, aunt and uncle, sat waiting at the bus term in Ramla. They were perhaps 50, 35 in all of this family. With them, they carried a few suitcases, bundles of clothes and gold strapped to their bodies. Ferdus, the girl guide, had also packed her uniform and brought along her knife and whistle. They had planned for a short trip in miles and in days. They were certain they would be coming back soon when the Arab armies recaptured Ramla. Well, um, without telling you too much about exactly what happened in the book, uh, they had to wait over 20 years to return to their home. And eventually, when they did return to their home, there was a, a, form, a Bulgarian family there who'd also been displaced uh, from Bulgaria, and they they uh, living in their house. And then follows this extraordinary encounter where the, the Bulgarian Jewish family and the Palestinian family made friends and decided to make their house into a house of peace and reconciliation where both Palestinians and Jews could discuss culture and issues of peace. So it's, it's, it's really a very interesting story which is very true but just to give you like that kind of that contemporary context of the, of the meaning of Ramla. So now I'm going to dive right back and say a little bit about what Ramla is. Now the first thing I should say because um, it's often confused many people I mean it's an obvious point many people confuse Ramla with Ramallah so the very similar names and they're both in a way kind of Palestinian capitals in a way. Ramallah is kind of the unofficial capital of, of um, today's Palestine, whilst Ramla was another type of um, capital. So um, I should the, the, the most significant fact probably about Ramla is to say that Ramla is really the only uh, city that was founded uh, as a new city uh, by the Arab Muslims after they conquered uh, the greater Syria and is the only city within within the region that they created. So most there's no other major city within Palestine that was actually created by the Muslims or, or by the Arabs as, as an Islamic city. So that's sort of kind of the most important sort of point to, to know about Ramla. Now, um, it was founded around about uh, 712 AD by Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, and he was the brother of the uh, Umayyad Caliph al-Walid, and it's founded in around 712 to be uh, as, as a city uh, next to um, the already existing uh, city of Lod or Lida. Now Lida was a primary, uh, was kind of an economic capital within Palestine. Um, I'll just so, show you this. Um, so this this little map you can see here is uh, shows you the um, divisions of, of Palestine under the Umayyads. And so it's uh, divided into um, two Juns or armies, regions, and so there's a Jund Philistine you'll see here. And it actually, um, in the early years of Islamic rule, the, the capital shifted. Uh, and so the first capital was Caesarea, and then the armies moved to Emwas, uh, known in biblical terms as Emmaus. And then the, the army there was struck by a plague and um, the capital moved then to, um, to Jerusalem. And then in 712, uh, um, uh, Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik declared uh, uh, um, Ramla uh, a new city. He created a new city, the city of Ramla, just next to Lida as, as, as a new capital. Now, Lida had previously been the um, uh, uh, a very important commercial centre within Palestine. Um, and the idea was that um, to create a city which instead of being controlled by the 
Christians and controlled by Muslims. So this new city was really coexisting textile industries in, in Lida, yet uh, creating a new space where, uh, from which the, the 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 Muslim rulers could 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 rule Palestine. Uh, and you'll see from this this slide here, you can see the the location. So Ramla's on the on the main highway between. Um, basically between Egypt, between uh, Egypt and Damascus, this kind of coastal road via Maris. And it's also significantly, it's on the, the, the main route between uh, Jaffa, um, the port of Jerusalem and Jerusalem. So it's in a, in a, in a perfect position economically. And um, although we, we don't know the exact Date of the foundation. It's, it's, we think it's roughly about uh, uh, 712. The um, construction of this city is by the 9th century historian Baladuri. And he said that the, the first thing that, that uh, Suleiman built uh, was his palace and an installation known as the dyer's work in the middle of which he installed the system. Now, um, you'll see if you actually look at the book, we've had, there's quite a lot of archaeological information about these cisterns and the dyeing that took place in Ramla. So again, this is a textile industry. So basically they're directly taking the textile industry from Lida and transplanting it to Ramla. And so right at that early stage, you see this link between the, the economics importance of the of the city and the region this this textile industry and also the um the um the uh the the, the location the the caliph uh the, the the um the ruler having his his um uh the ruler of governor of palestine having his palace there and so he, uh, as soon as he built the dyer's work and the, the, the industrial implantation in, in his palace, he, then he also laid out a mosque next door and built it. And, but he became caliph before he'd finished and then he, um, he, he built it a little bit more. And subsequently, Omar ibn Abdulaziz completed the plan, although to reduce plan. Um, and so he also dug a, a canal uh, for the people of Ramla and called it Barada after the name of the uh, the, the, the river in um, in Damascus. And he also excavated various wells. Um, and um, the mosque was built by um, he by a, a Christian uh, who he employed to do this. And um, the other. The important thing is that, um, and this is emphasised by all the all the historians, is that before Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, there is no city of Ramla, and its place was just sand, Ramla. And so the general idea is that the name of uh, the name for the city, Ramla, comes from the idea of this this idea that you have um, an empty, uninhabited area, and it's like kind of it's sort of perhaps a reference to it just being. It's built on 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 bare land. Um, uh, th there there are also some other possibilities for the name. Um, there there have been some ideas that perhaps there was maybe some um, some uh, some derivation from some Jewish name, but that's generally been discounted. And there's another sort of intriguing possibility that the name may actually be some reference to. Um, one of Muhammad's wives, his youngest wife, called who's also called Ramla. So these are some sort of ideas. But generally speaking, the the most accepted idea is that the name Ramla comes from the name of sand, and so it's this idea of, a, I suppose, a, what we using another sort of uh, material we describe it as a clean slate. It was just a brand new place. Now, um, uh, the, the the problem, of course, with founding a new city and this is this is often the case is that especially when you're trying to determine the location yourself instead of relying on natural features is that you have to um the, the, the rambler and this occurs throughout its history it was always short of water because it wasn't built on a natural water source 
And as as we heard from Baladuri, the, a special canal was built to supply the city. Um, and we'll hear a bit more about, I'll say a little bit more about that. So um, what I'm showing you now is a map of, of, of Ramla um, with, with the early Islamic buildings and features identified in the city. So actually, since this map was made, there have been many more excavations in Ramla. And these are, these are detailed in the book in, um, in a section by... Um, Gideon Avni, who is in charge of the um, excavation uh, department in the Israel Antiquities Authority. And he very generously was able to supply a, a really excellent summary of all the excavations that have taken place within Ramla. And there have been very many because of the, there's a lot of building work taking place in Ramla since since the year about 2000. So there's been huge numbers of excavations. And now in archeological terms, we know a lot more about Ramla than we did at the beginning. And as I say, this is, this is really one of the benefits of, of this project having taken so long. But really, um, I think one of the things that's come out of getting the, the, the work, this archeological work by the Israel Antiquities Authority is just really how big, um, Amayyad early Islamic Ramla was. That's that's one of the things. And then the other thing is that's in a way is no surprise, but it's come across very strongly is that um, really, although the city was founded by Suleiman Abdul Malik, really the the height of the, the city's prosperity was was achieved sort of really after about 750 and during after the Abbasid period and right into the Fatimid period. So really right up to, up until about the uh, the 900s, this was a really thriving city. And this is reflected, for example, if you look at um, some of the Geniza documents uh, edited by Goiton, and you can see in these, there's vast numbers of letters uh, written from, from merchants in Ramla to the correspondence in Egypt. And you can see the vast trade that was being carried out from Ramla. So you really get an idea that this is a, a, a major uh, financial center. And, it, and this is reflected in the archeology span by the drill installations and also the houses that uh, have been excavated. Um, and so the houses, many of the houses are, are, are large buildings, villas, I'd say, well spaced out. And really, um, you get an impression of a, a, a very pleasant place to live with, with pl uh, a thriving economy, large villas uh, where people could live. And also we have from... Again, from the Geniza documents and also from other sources. So we know, for example, there's, there's a Jewish quarter with its own markets. Uh, there's also um, so lots of different people who are living in Ramla. And it's really a, a major hub uh, for people uh, living in, in Palestine. Um, I'm just... Um, and so this is what I'm showing you here is the... Al Anazir cisterns at Ramla. These are probably one of the most famous mon surviving monuments of the early Islamic period in Ramla. And this is a, a picture taken in, uh, I'd say, uh, 1960s. And this shows the, um, just gives you a view of the cisterns. And this, these are those cisterns now restored. Um, so the, the boats stand them. It, which you can ride around inside, but this, these cisterns are, are, are very significant and there's a, 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 an inscription uh, within the uh, cisterns cut into the plaster which details how these uh, cisterns were created during the feed. Which is which is very significant in the ninth century. It shows that there's huge investment still being carried on into the late into the uh, Abbasid period, and showing how the how the city was thriving and needed these vast cisterns to supply the ever growing population of the city. So um, just and just incidentally, these these cisterns architecturally are important because I think they're the first 
use consistent use of the pointed arch in Islamic architecture, which later was fed into Gothic architecture. So this is a very important monument in, in that architecturally as well. Um, and just just to continue on the theme of water, um, I mentioned in Baladuri's uh, description, he also mentioned this uh, this this water source, uh, the uh, Barada, this canal which is uh, which is uh, built to supply Ramla, because as I said, it was a it was a sandy open plain before the city was founded, and. Um, water had to be supplied and instead of getting it from Lida it was supplied by this specially constructed canal which collected water from near Tel Geza and you can see that on this little plan it's down in the bottom right hand corner that's Tel Geza and the uh, this is the line of the cistern which was um, which was detected and um, and um, studied by the archaeologist Amir Gozaljani, uh, and if you look here, this is uh, just some examples of where the where the the canal has or the aqueduct supplying city has, has been uncovered and excavated in recent years. So, um, and one of the one of the things that's come out from this uh, study of this this aqueduct is that actually there are many layers of replastering, rebuilding. So it's it was a very very well maintained aqueduct, and I I should imagine very expensive to maintain, but it was maintained both by replastering and 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 um, rebuilding when necessary when it's damaged and covered over. So. Uh, there was a very strong incentive for maintaining uh, a good water supply to the city, which obviously was supported by the economy of the city. So it's really very well worth doing this. And again, with the with the cisterns we see uh, built uh, in the time of Haruna Rashid, there was obviously an incentive to keep people living and to keep the lifestyle of people living in this city right into the into the into the uh, 10th and early 11th century but one of the other by this time by we get to the time we get to 11th century we start to see um, some of the problems which are known throughout the Middle East to sort of really begin to impact on Ramla and so we start to get accounts of um, of uh, the, for example, the aqueduct not working and people being short of water and everybody has to build their own cisterns or in their own houses. So we start to get some idea of decline. And so by the time of the, um, the um, uh, Crusader conquest at the end of the 11th century, they actually, when they arrived at Ramla, um, they found the city de deserted, the gates open. By this time, the, initially we think the city didn't have a wall, but by the 11th century, the city did have a wall and this has been detected in a few places. But the Crusaders basically found the city undefended and they're simply able to walk into the city and, and occupy it. And, um, and you can see in in the book within Dennis Pringle's section, you can see a, a really detailed uh, discussion of the Crusader Ramla, um, and you can see um, how, how the Crusaders basically fundamentally remodeled the city, and so that the city we have today, the old city of Ramla which is essentially a product of the post-Crusader period. Um, so, uh, but before uh, talking more about that, I'll just mention the second most famous monument, or possibly the most famous, depending on your background, is the, is the, uh, the, the White Mosque in Ramla. And um, this is chiefly famous uh, for amongst sort of non-specialists for the tower and the tower is known locally as the Tower of 40 Martyrs because there's a story that um, 
that uh, it was built by the Mamluk, well, that it was built by, that there are a variety of stories. There's a, there was a persistent belief that this is actually a crusader tower built by the crusaders, and then kind of later, later repurposed as a minaret for the, the White Mosque. This has really been discounted and it's, it's because of the, the nature of the construction where a Mamluk inscription is, is physically embedded within the, the whole structure of the, it's impossible that it could be a crusader construction, but it does include many uh, stylistic features such as the, as the cushion voussoirs and other, other features and some of the capitals are reused. So it reuses a lot of um, um, uh, crusader uh, materials and, and style within it, but it's basically a, a Mamluk construction from the early uh, 14th century, built on the site of a, an earlier uh, minaret, but it's called the Tower of Forty Martyrs because according to the um, uh, a local story, um, they, they use Christian captured crusader uh, uh, laborers to, or arch, uh, builders to make the tower and when they'd finished they all had they, they pushed them all off so this is the, the name of the story of, of, of the tower so the tower is the most still today it's the most sort of um most well-known symbol of ramla and you can see it's it's something that we've used on the on the, on the front cover of the book but the mosque the white mosque itself is actually much older um so it says originally built in the Umayyad period and it's mentioned by Baladuri. And according to those early texts, it seems like the, um, the, uh, the mosque was built uh, adjacent to um, the uh, governor's palace. And by analogy with other early Islamic cities, for example, Kufa and Basra in Iraq and other, other, other uh, early um, Islamic cities. It, it's probable that the, that the palace, that the governor's palace have actually stood at the back of the, um, uh, uh, of the mosque in an area that, which is currently a Muslim cemetery. So that hasn't really been excavated. Although it's probably worth mentioning that you can see, I've, I've, I've seen in that area that you get lots of um, glass mosaic tesserae, tesserae which could possibly come from palatial building, but obviously as a, as a, as a, as a uh, so, but this is the, uh, what you can see here in this picture is, is the Mamluk structure um, uh, from the 13th century uh, built on the, on the remains of the Umayyad mosque. Um, and also beneath, Beneath the mosque, there are also cisterns, very similar to the cisterns, um, uh, the Alanir, the cisterns I mentioned earlier, the Alanazir cisterns, and um, it seems quite likely that they are of a, a similar date, probably ninth century. Um, so um, I'll just show you here. Um, um, uh, uh, a mosaic, a mosaic inscription uh, uh, from excavations by uh, Miriam Rosen Eilon, which were carried out in Ramla in the 1970s, 60s, 70s. And uh, this was excavated from a house, uh, one of these large palatial villas that, that this seemed to have occupied much of the space of Ramla. And um, Within the house, uh, this mihrab mosaic was found, which is interesting. So it seems like, as well as the obviously the, the white mosque, the main mosque, there were places for personal devotion or family devotion devotions within within the uh, within the well-to-do houses. So this is just a, a very interesting example of that. And I thought I'd just show you some other examples now of the excavations that have been taken taking place and the, they're, they're ongoing within Ramla. These are excavations which took place in the 1990s. Uh, quite deep stratigraphy um, and on the top right hand you can see um, uh, 
um, which is uh, not a very good photograph, but we've got a much better photograph in the book. And this is of a, of a, um, a mosaic um, scene um, showing um, from the 10th to the 11th century, um, from a vault um, to the south of the White Mosque. So this is a, it seems like a large number, a lot of these villas had huge mosaics, um, very similar to, um, to similar quality to, some of them of similar quality, what you might have seen in Herbert al Maftur in the Jordan Valley. And just down to the right, you can see a range of uh, ceramics. Most of these are um, sort of early Islamic ninth, eighth, ninth century, uh, and including um, also vessels made from marble, which is uh, uh, reworked. And just earlier on, I mentioned the fact that after the Crusaders uh, took over, um, okay, the the city seems to have been suffered severe decline before the arrival of the Crusaders, and that's to do with political uh, problems within the uh, Fatimid Empire and the Islamic world and uh, incoming Turkomans, and also kind of junction uh, sort of between sort of like the Fatimid world and, and the the, um, the rest of the Caliphate. So. It, uh, it really suffered and, and once the Crusaders established themselves, it's probable, it seems likely that the Crusaders established themselves in an area that was already inhabited uh, by Christians. And so in a sense, the old city, which we have today is um, the, the, the city that um, the, the, what had been the uh, Christian quarter in the early Islamic period. Um, and so this is just a view of Ramla as it is today. I'll just check for time. Are we? Am, am I okay for time? Yeah. I think if you can just wind up. Uh, okay, right. Sorry. Up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, wind yeah. up. Sorry, we yeah. can. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the other the other famous mosque in Ramla is actually the Crusade, a converted Crusader church. This is another major major um, landmark and. Just inside of that church, which was subsequently uh, converted into a mosque, and you can see similar examples, whereby you just uh, you just in this case convert the, the southern wall into you put insert a mihrab in there. So that's um, and so lastly, I'll just say a little bit about some of the medieval buildings in Ramla. This is just a few examples. So on the left, top left, you have the um, a bathhouse, Hamama Radwan. This is a large, very large bathhouse. On the right, you get a caravanserai, Khan, Khan al Idham. And uh, down to the left, you have what is known as the Moroccan uh, Mosque. Uh, and on bottom right is uh, Mamluk tomb, Sheikh Hama, which uh, visited with Donald Richards. He's very taken with this. It had some quite important inscriptions in it. And this is uh, interesting. Um, I should probably say that the old city of Ramla, um, there are probably some changes at the moment, but at the time of a lot of the survey work, a lot of the old religious buildings uh, were lived in by, uh, let's say, Arabs, Palestinians, who were uh, uh, perhaps first moved into them as refugees, and then were later living in them, kind of protecting them and providing some sort of, uh, apparently in recent times, some of these buildings have been uh, repurposed. So, okay, thank you, that's, uh, that's just a brief overview. I could go on, but I think it's time to. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Andrew, for the, the overview and also for the sort of insights into the book and the, and the period of time and the length of study and, and of, the, of the city itself. I'm going to now um, hand over to Dr. Richard McClary to, to ask some um, initial questions around the architecture, so you can say a little bit more about some of the things you've mentioned yeah, too. Good. 
Thanks, Carol. Yes, and thanks, Angela. That was a really fascinating uh, uh, overview and, and, and with detailed elements as well. Um, you know, I think it's it's still good that the book has come out. I know you said it was a long time coming, but uh, you know, the, the gestation adds to the quality. So, um, I mean, there's a there's a few things I'll go through. A few of the things I, I I'd like to pick up on, and then ask maybe if you can respond specifically to this. I mean, I think it's really interesting that there there seems to be evidence of a Basid investment. And that seems to be something that in the context of Damascus, that you know, it wasn't the capital that they weren't as keen to invest in. So it's, it's interesting that they are investing in, in the Aramala at this point and, and the point about the pointed arch. Um, you know, the, the water is obviously key in the, uh, the water infrastructure and, and the wider context. You know, the, 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 the white mosque seems very similar to, to things even, you know, as far away as Sylvan up, up in the sort of what is now Turkey, but of course is still historically just part of the same region that they live in architecture and um, the, the use of spoilers very interesting i see there's that little bit sticking out of the, the jami al uh, <laughs> I minaret. you might comment if there's more yeah. examples of that um, mm. and, and also the elbow bracket because it's something i'm my own personal obsession with elbow brackets and their use you know they have them in the the the, the mosque in in, in um, uh, 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 um, uh, Alexa Mosque uses them in the rebuild after the, the occupation, uh, mm -hmm. and new ones seem to be used even up in, in Konya in the Aladdin Mosque. So um, that, that that would be quite interesting. So uh, it was fascinating to see that the White Mosque um, and 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 a hint of the, the Crusader Church. So I, I've got a few things to unpack, but I wondered if you could speak, you know, just a, a little bit about that wider context, where the buildings fit into the wider regional context, and, and maybe something mm -hmm. on Spolia as well. Yeah, okay. Um, well, in terms of wider regional context, uh, that, that is, that's, it's an interesting, very interesting sort of question. And just, let, let's say, just, just within Palestine, for example, um, you get, of course, Jerusalem, which is sort of very well known, very well studied. And then you get kind of Gaza. And it's interesting that um, just in terms of architectural techniques, materials, um, I'd say Ramla kind of, as you'd expect, as it actually is, it sort of fits between the, between the two. Um, um, and just a little point, which I, I think is probably worth mentioning, is um, I, talk, I talked about the, ha the houses quite a lot. I mentioned some of the houses from the early Islamic period, and we have later houses, but... I, I strongly think um, that a lot of the earlier houses were probably built of uh, mud brick or mud construction. And this, this seemed to have been missing uh, from the excavation. So I think possibly the excavators weren't kind of expecting this. So there's, you find a lot of the, a lot of the, um, a lot of, remains domestic remains and a lot of the outlines of houses and it's you, i mean it could be that yeah i mean obviously there was stone robbing but i suspect there's also a lot of houses built out of mud brick as well um uh and we have a, a, the odd example but I, i'd say what's interesting is so it's been very hard to actually reconstruct the actual forms of some of the some of the early houses um and in terms of sort of uh, the regional pattern, I'd say, um, yeah, I mean, the White Mosque obviously evolved over a period of, you know, 600 years or whatever, um, gradually changed. Um, and just what's worth pointing out is that in terms of topography, the White Mosque actually stands outside the old city of Ramla today. So you get the old city and then the white mosque. So I think it's already understood um, uh, in the post-Crusader period that the that Ramla represented this ancient, the, the white mosque represented this ancient sort of glorious city. And it seems to be that the the Ayyubids uh, were the first people to kind of rebuild the uh, the white mosque, which was substantially damaged. So of that. That, that photograph I showed you, that it seems like they actually, first of all, built one small part to kind of get it going again. And um, Ibn Battuta, I think he, he mentioned the hundreds of martyrs that are buried in, in Ramla, the hundreds of um, Muslim saints that are buried there. And so I think by 
after the Crusades, it, it kind of acquired this um, this um, this aura of a place that represented the glories of the early Islamic world, which is why the White Mosque was rebuilt on such a massive scale in the early uh, um, 14th century, together with this huge, huge minaret. So it's kind of very symbolic, I think. Uh, and um, yeah, and as to the the, the use of spoiler, so there's yeah, there's the, you're right to point. There's two. Oh, well, actually, there's 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 some very interesting things. So when Ramla was founded in the um, in about 712, um, Suleiman he he got quite angry because first of all he demanded. Uh, it really arose out of a dispute with the leaders of the city of Lida that um, he wanted basically, I mean, he wanted basically to be able to live there and to take a proportion of their profits. And the, um, the, the merchants or the leaders of Lida were not prepared to do this. So he said, OK, I'm going to destroy Lida. He meant economically. Um, so, but what he did is he, he ripped down a lot of buildings there and they actually invented, according to, uh, I think, the courtesy, they invented a special saw for cutting up marble, uh, <laughs> a new type of sort of device which could cut up. So there's, yeah, there's plentiful uh, reuse, like, and you can see from the excavations, and I've even seen it myself, there's a lot of mar mar marble cut up from reused and and then, of course, yeah, so there's there's a lot of that. Um, so let's say Byzant Byzantine uh, marble reused. And I think the um, in the Jami al Maghrabi, the one where you showed a bit of chancel screen jutting out. Yeah, I think that's 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 uh, from a from a Byzantine uh, church. But then there is also extensive reuse, say, for example, in um, the White Mosque, the Tower of the White Mosque. But also in some of the other buildings, like um, uh, there's 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 um, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, yeah, in in some of the other Mus Muslim uh, uh, tombs, there's a lot of reused Crusader material, and then of course there's the the very famous the 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 uh, the great mosque which is obviously a crusader church which has kind of been repurposed and i think all of this was not just convenience as well as you know if you look at if you look at the white mosque and the the great mosque which became which today is the the principal friday mosque of of the old city of ramla there's clearly a message in there of sort of kind of triumph over over christianity that you've got a, a rebirth of the the ancient city and and the commemoration in the White Mosque. Plus, you've also got this important Crusader building, which has been repurposed as, as a mosque. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's that's really really helpful and really good to, to expand on. Yeah. I thought the, the quality of the the mosaics that you showed saw was also really interesting because mm. Kibbutz al Mafja always always sort of runs away with the glory quite rightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's not a unicum in, in that sense. Mm. So that that was really interesting. Well, I'm sure there's lots of uh, lots of questions going to be coming in. So I'm going to leave it at that point and hand over to Maher to to take over. Ready to join us and uh, and comment. Hello. <laughs> oh well, while well, my house coming, I, I, I did think it was really interesting what you said about the, the the bare brick, it not being an entirely lithic city, even for the luxury buildings. So mm, so, mm, yeah, and. Um, I mean, the, the other thing that's probably worth mentioning is the very sprawl, the early Islamic city was really sprawling. I mean, um, yeah, so it, it, we don't even know the outer extents of it. It seems to be vast, actually. Um, and that area, I mean, OK, it's the, the, there's the textile trade and the money and stuff, but also agriculturally, that area seems to be incredibly wealthy as well. So um, there's a very dense network of small villages around. So there seems to be an urban sprawl as well in, in that uh, uh, early period. Um, Thank you. Right, I'm going to I'm going to leave it to yeah. my now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Dr. Maha, are you, are you able to join us? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm there to be honest. Okay. I've, been, I've been trying to, uh, have, uh, you can't stop can we... because the host has stopped it. Okay, uh, we, can, we can hear you, but we can't see you if you right. want to. Um, yeah, see, I've, all right, okay, so, uh, because I've, I've tried uh, to open the camera, but it keeps telling me that you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Uh, but it's okay. I'll, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll try and fix this one. All right, you. okay. If you ask your question. Right, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, 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 first of all, um, um, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be with you tonight. And uh, I'm very thankful to you, Claire, uh, uh, and uh, to every person actually uh, behind the scene organizing this session. Um, also, uh, my thanks goes to uh, my thanks go to uh, Andrew and Richard. It's very important uh, topic to be to be discussed tonight. It's very informative uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I have learned a lot of things tonight from Andrew and from the questions brought forward by Richard. Uh, and uh, I think it's the time has come to deal with the historical issue rather than uh, uh, archaeology and. Uh, 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 other matters. Uh, I think. I think. Uh, um, I'll just go back to the time in which the city was established. Um, for, first of all, let me just speak about the, why it was named by 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 Ar Ramla. By the way, in Arabic we say Ar Ramla, but in English we say Ramla. Uh, and therefore, uh, if if we need to know exactly why why it was named or, or why, why it was given that name, for sure, it's not not because the the prophet's uh, uh, wife. Uh, has the, had the name of Ramla because it should be a Ramla, or uh, there is like a historical narrative that uh, uh, Sulaiman Abd ibn Abdul Malik, the person who uh, demarcated and he built the city, uh, he was passing by a, a tent and he found a lady with the name of Ramla, and because of that he decided to 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 call the city uh, as Ramla. No, no, to be honest. Um, I think Ar Ramla comes, if, uh, you know, Ar Raml sands, and because the location it, it was not inhabited by people, most likely it was given that name because of as as you know, you know, Doctor Andrew was trying to explain these things. I, th I think I think uh, I'm inclined to go towards uh, toward uh, uh, um, that this city was named Ar Ramla after you know, or because of the Raml, or because of the sand surrounded the area. I have got a question to Andrew. Uh, we know that Ramla and Alud, because Ramla, you know, it's as as part mm -hmm. of that region, uh, Alud was was conquered by Umar ibn al-As during the waves of the Muslim conquest during the you know in the seventh century. Uh, talking about uh, or m more particularly on uh, six three seven. Uh, mm -hmm. Then he, he went to Alud, and because Lud was a very important city during the Byzantium time, he put his hand on Lud and he considered it as the capital of Palestine or Palestine the first at that time. But what, what, why Sulaiman Abdul Malik, Ibn Abdul Malik, took him that long? We know that he came later on to become the ruler of Palestine, but why took him a relatively long period of time to establish a Ramla and to have it? As the capital of Palestine, or the uh, the 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 place in which he ruled the country, why 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 he didn't uh, continue with what started with others uh, with regarding Lud, and then to extend a Lud, uh, any reason, any political reason? I know Lud was uh, 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 an economic hub. Yeah. Uh, Lud, uh, as you mentioned, was in a very strategic place. But why he didn't think of combining these two things together? Any reason behind that? Uh, uh, was yeah. he trying to make it later on the capital of the Umayyad Caliph uh, in, in parallel with, with Damascus? Or, or there, there is something behind uh, his decision. This first one, the way he did, the, the, the way he demarketed and the city, uh, it was in a very, very clever way, which, which, which uh, later on could help thousands of people to come and live. And we know that when he created the city, he made it in a different quarter. So people from different tribes could come and live. And that what, what really happened. And you mentioned the end with that he started with the palace, then he went to, uh, to build the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the headquarters of ruling, then the mosque and the market. Um, wh 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 why he very in why he was very interested in making that city in particular uh, a very in a very important yeah. 
so, so I, hope, I hope you'll be able to, yeah, to yeah. give me. Okay. Uh, I, th thank you. Thank you. That's 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 really uh, an important question, and it really goes to the heart of this this whole thing. And I think because Ramler is, as I say, is sort of pretty unique in 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 in. Um, well, in the greater Syria, I suppose, in this, in the Levant, let's say it's it's really almost unique as a as a Muslim new city. Uh, this isn't something that's sort of more common in the, uh, let's say, in Iraq, where you have uh, Kufa, Basra, Wasit, and lots of other places. So, um, and also Samara uh, later on, and Baghdad. So the, there's a, there's a tradition there, but within this area, it's kind of within an area that's like had lots of thriving Byzantine and earlier cities, why, why do you found a new city? Um, I, th I, th I think part of the reason is the reason given is that um, this idea of um, gaining control of, I think a financial thing, because if you look at Baladuri, he said, what he says about the, the first buildings, there, which is the, the dyer's house, in other words, the place that's making making the dyed cloth. And remember, for 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 for, for us in the twenty first century, clothes are very cheap, <laughs> textiles are cheap. But I, I'm increasingly struck by the fact that in the past, clothes were super luxury items and like worth. I mean, there's always you read in these gift exchanges. There, there's often cloth that's that's exchanged. So, cloth had a, 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 a and textiles had a, a kind of value, which is hard for us to appreciate nowadays. So, if you're if you're able to have a production center to produce luxury items and dyeing was essentially the thing that really added the value when you were able to use purple dyes and various dyes to actually make colored cloth. This was something that was really, you're really uh, giving great extra value to these textiles. So I'd say the fact that he founded this, this textile dyeing factory and his palace is the first things and the mosque is the third thing a bit later on. I think that really says something about that economics is kind of like really very much involved in this. Because if you compare it to foundation histories for say some of the other early Islamic new towns, there it's really much more to do with the, um, the mosque and the tribal allocations and the governor's palace and industry doesn't kind of really feature in there at all. Whereas in this case, industry kind of features straight away. The other thing is, I think, as he said, I think that this idea of uh, being um, uh, being caliph and his his position within within the family and whether, you know, naming naming the aqueduct as Barada, whether he was trying to create a rival to Damascus is kind of an idea. And I, it reminds me of um, Samara when that was founded by the Abbasids and the, the caliph al-Mutawakil, uh, who founded who founded a new bit of Samara and he said quite famously, now I know that I'm king because I've built a new city and live in it. And I think there's something about this in it as well, is that the if you feel powerful enough and you've got the resources, the idea of kind of immortalizing yourself by founding a city is, is, is quite a big thing. And, um, and I think, again, the fact that the water supply was so difficult there and so expensive was kind of like a way of saying, well, look, look what I can do, I'm so rich. You know, if you won't let me into your city of Lida and to share in the profits there, I can just produce my own my own city right next to you, steal all your trade and um, and and find a new city. But I think also within that, what's quite interesting, and I think it says a lot about the whole process of the Islamic conquest in various places, and we know about the the, the the peace pact for Jerusalem is the is the fact that really at the time it, it, during this early period and I'd say really in most of the period before the Crusades Muslims were probably in the minority the majority of the population in Palestine would have been Christian and really they wanted to get on with the with the with the resident population so 
even though like he did some sort of like things which obviously the Christians in Lydda wouldn't have liked, taking some of the, knocking down some of their churches. You're not talking about sort of really massacres here or anything like that. You're talking about, and the fact that he didn't just steal land, he actually founded a new city in a place which I suspect he probably bought or was wasteland. So he's actually getting a very cheap location. And like with, again, with the foundation of say Baghdad or something, what you're getting is you're getting a, as you, as you pointed out, you're getting a, a financial, you're actually able to make money from this because apart from having the ind industrial thing, you can sell allocations in your new city, your new development, which is provided with water in a place that, so it's really a good place for, he also made a profit in that way. So I think in a sense, you could say for both business reasons and, you know, I'd say he's probably quite an astute businessman, plus also had ideas of, um, of, of, of perhaps, you know, um, uh, improving his own position in, in history. Right. Okay. Um, um, oh, thanks. Thanks for the for for, for the answer. Uh, just just to follow up with what you, what you you were uh, just to follow up and, and and or to continue by saying that Aristakhri, uh, uh, who died on the uh, mid tenth century, uh, mm -hmm. he was describing Al Ramla by saying that it is the biggest city of uh, in Palestine, mm -hmm. even it's bigger than. Jerusalem, which means yeah. that, and he died almost 200 years uh, after the establishment of, or the foundation, the, uh, mm. uh, the establishment of Ar Ramla. That, that goes actually what uh, what uh, you were were, were saying. Uh, um, let me just, uh, uh, I'll be talking about the time of the, I'll be, I'll just, I'll be giving some some uh, mm. very yes. very good information good. About, about the time of the Crusaders, and then uh, I'll be asking you a question. We know yeah. that. Salah al-Din, when he became the Sultan of Egypt, and that was in 1174, mm. uh, and he delayed uh, uh, his project to liberate Jerusalem because there were some uh, uh, some people who caused him some troubles from uh, in Aleppo, in al Mosul, and then he delayed fighting the Crusaders. Yes, he had a, a, a tiny and small battles here and there. But when it comes to Ar Ramla, no, he 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 went to Ar Ramla at some point, and that was in 1177, and then he recaptured Ar Ramla. Of course, um, uh, th that gives us uh, um, like a hint that even for Salah al-Din, Ar Ramla uh, 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 was an important location, whether from a political point of view or security point of view or or uh, economic point of view. Mm -hmm. And that was that was haters. Have implied Jerusalem with the Muslims for long. We know that that in in 1204 they recaptured uh, Ar Ramla. Although Ar Ramla was the place in which uh, 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 the Treaty of Ar Ramla was signed between uh, Salah al-Din and King Richard the Lionheart. Uh, so although in one of the in the term, or like one of the, like in in the terms or one term within the treaty that Alud and Ramla should be uh, shared by Muslims and the Crusaders or it's like, let's say let's divide the two cities between mm -hmm. me and you mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and I'll take that part. Uh, is that does that give you an indication that even for the Crusaders, Al Ramla is a very very important place and also for Salah al-Din. Uh, another uh, another issue the social life I'm, I'm to be honest i do teach some uh, uh, some courses in 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 social history to my students at qatar university and normally anything related to economic uh, life or social life of, of any community or city uh, uh, you know it just grabs my attention grab my attention mm. uh, 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 greatly um, uh, and i come across and and uh, 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 yeah the that endowment you know endowment deed by uh, uh, Abu Huda, remember, and mm -hmm. that talks about how this guy and mm -hmm. it's part of uh, uh, the volume. It's 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 dealing with something related to social life and economic life. That person who has who had lots of uh, uh, built uh, lots of houses, a factory for soup, mm -hmm. uh, 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 for soap. Sorry, uh, he mm -hmm. has a, a place to provide people with water. So he tried to manage all these things before he died. And, and it's very interesting to read this endowment and to know how people were dealing with these things at that point. The other thing, uh, um, and I'll just speak briefly about mm -hmm. it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the diary of uh, uh, 
uh, Yusuf Dahshan, yes, yes, uh, uh, yes. a priest of, of Ar-Ramla who was living uh, in the 18th century. Uh, he, he wrote a long diary uh, uh, predicting what's going to happen if this uh, if the climate was so and so if the if the uh, uh, if 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 this happened and if that happened this person will die if somebody comes so it's very interesting to know how people were thinking at that time uh, and how what what kind of mentality people had mm. at that time um, what, 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 you, you, you know that uh, you know about uh, uh, the, this diary and about the endowment mm -hmm. and uh, but I want I want an answer regarding yeah. uh, the Crusaders and Salah Din's yeah. prayers. okay thank you yeah that, thank you. that's that, that's good I mean I think well just just uh, this is this overall thing I'd say what, what what I find fascinating about Ramra is just that it's got this very long history Islamic history and um, it, you can kind of because it came to being it was created within the full full um, full uh, you know it's fully historically documented within historical time it's interesting you can see the whole evolution and decline and rise again of, of this city and in terms of um, in terms of Salahuddin and Richard and the and 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 and, and the the importance attached to a Ramla. I think, I think that that's that's really. Um, I think its significance by that stage. I think, I think it partly it's the location. I think because the location, if you think of it, on the location between Jerusalem and and Jaffa. I think that that location, and still, you know, under the Mamluks and under the Ottomans, it was still an important. I think the Franciscan hospice in in Ramla was the main main real stopping place for pilgrims traveling from Jerusalem, traveling to Jerusalem from Europe. So, and it, it caused all sorts of misunderstandings. But but so Ramla is important, and I think to it's also its economic importance in terms of its its location in the coastal plain, and it's um, so. Even though the city may have been smaller by that time, it still controlled a lot of very wealthy villages, and so the revenues from these were were, were kind of very important. And so it's I'd say it's it's an important city in in a wealthy area, and that's kind of and it's on the trade routes. And just to go to the a bit later to the 18th century, I think what what's interesting then and something which. I think we could do more about is that there seems to have been a re revival in the 18th century uh, in the region in general, but particularly you can see it in Ramla. And so you see new types of architecture being built. You see people becoming very wealthy. And so you see, um, you, you, you actually get, um, you actually get a, an expansion, I think, of the populated area. So I think Ramla in the 18th century becomes, again, very important and you get lots of renovations. And I know there's a windmill built uh, in the, uh, I think is in the 17th century. So there's a lot of investments in Ramla and it remains consistently um, a wealthy, important uh place um, and I think it's interesting in this in this respect that also right next to it today you get Tel Aviv International Airport so that location remains and it's also had it's is one of the first place in Palestine to have a railway station as well so that you get this throughout its history its location it, the importance of its location is reinforced despite the fact that let's say Jerusalem for example always takes all the attention really economically and in terms of infrastructure a center on the coast in that area whether it be Tel Aviv or whether it's Ramla has always been very important so that's second I think what kind of comes out of that yeah. yes thank you um I would, we've been trying to give people the uh, the link to the book <laughs> in the in the chat, ah, right. yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. and it seems to be um, it seems to be a, a, a broken a broken link. We uh, a number very kindly ah, a number okay. of the audience are already are also checking. But if you can just search um, 
Archeopress yeah. and, and Rumler or Peterson or Pringle, it should, it should come up. And also just to say the other link that I, um, that I put in the chat was for the CBRL project library where you, you can find a list of uh, publications around, uh, around on the Ramla project um, in various, uh, from various periods from early on until, until later. And thank you. Um, I realize we're running slightly, slightly late, but thank you. We've still got a good number of people in the audience and I'd like to move on to, um, I'd like to move on to your, your questions. And uh, starting with one from Dino Politis, um, who asks, Ramla was built as a Muslim city, but you mentioned a Jewish mer merchant community and Christian mosque builders. Are there textual accounts for these non-Muslim residents of Ramla? Certainly during the Ottoman period, there were tax registers recording details of the various um, communities. Can you comment? on yeah. the populations. Yeah. Ah, yeah, well, I, I, can't, I can't remember actual estimates of figures, but large, I'd say. And, and I'd say further than that, we know, for example, from the Geniza records, we know that I mentioned there's a Jewish market. Actually, there are about four or five Jewish markets. So they're actually, and that's just for the Jewish Jewish area. So you're actually talking, and Jews weren't the majority in the, in in the, in the city. So you're actually talking about um, yeah, large numbers of Jews and Christians. So yeah, I think yeah, right right from the very very beginning. And I think it from, from what I what I think is important really, and this applies, I was gonna to say to the whole of Palestine, but actually to the whole region is that, I'd say that the, the number of Muslims in the area would have been started off quite small and only gradually, and I think really is only after the Crusades that you get large numbers of Muslims. So any city founded before then um, would have had a, a high high proportion of people from other places, yeah, so Christians and, and, and Jews. And Samaritans, yeah, that's the other thing I should say. There are a large number of Samaritans living in, in Ramla as well. So it was already cosmopolitan. And I think, I think that's also to do with the nature of its location. And it's, again, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's quite nearby. If you think of like, uh, if you compare, say, Tel Aviv with, with Jerusalem, there's the cosmopolitanism, I, I'd say, that you get, you get merchants, you get, it's people who are there to do, you know, rather than for, it's not a religious city, really, but I suppose that's the thing, even though it had religious buildings and it had, um, had a mosques, churches and, and, and synagogues, we know it had synagogues, although it had all of these things, Right from the beginning, it's 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 really about trade and, and and communication, and I think it's well to remember that today is that the you know this this idea of coexistence for mutual benefit was always kind of there, and just just being able to trade and to do business and to travel was much more important than um, than sort of kind of what religion or identity you have, yeah. Another question we have mm. from Sal, Sam Wolf, who says, I excavated a Byzantine period that is pre-Ramla olive oil production complex on the outskirts of Ramla. I am wondering if there is evidence for olive oil production in the city itself. I seem to recall references to soap made from olive oil factories there. Is there anything else related to olive production? Uh, any uh, evidence did you that you can um, comment on? No, um, not not particularly. There may be. There are some things which may have been to do with oil production, and there are some collecting vats which may be to do with it. But uh, I don't think that's been. Sort of, it could have been used for other things, so I'm, I'm not not entirely sure of that. But I think I, I think it's probably quite likely. Although Lida is more, I mean, in Ottoman and Mandate times, Lida was much more closely tied to olive oil production and soap soap production. So it could be the case. I'm not sure, but it could be the case that that was something that Lida Lida kind of capitalised on 
as that they specialised in rather than uh, Rumler. Thank you. And uh, we've just got <laughs> two more questions, um, um, and then we will close for this evening. And the first one is from uh, Mahmoud Hawari, who asks, <laughs> any, remain <laughs> any remains of walls and fortifications? Uh, were there any remains of walls and fortifications uh, um, dating from the Umayyad period or later medieval times? Um, I think, I think, I think there's maybe two places where the a wall has been identified and I'd say this this wall is probably 11th century so this is the wall that the crusaders would have encountered um, and it's been it's been detected near well this is a very specific but it's near the railway line <laughs> there is a there's one place where it's kind of been detected I don't think it's it hasn't been looked at in the great great detail but there has been a small amount. and there's also another location where we think there was a gate and there's some evidence but it's it's slightly ambiguous so that would be something that would be interesting to look at more but there's it's really sort of not ephemeral not ephemeral but the the, the, the it's there's not a lot of evidence for the wall just very slight we know the line yes Thank you. And our final question <laughs> yeah. for this evening is from Rosalind Wade Haddon, who yes. asks, who says, thank you very much, first yes. of all, for a great survey. And she's asking what textiles were produced in, in the city? Do we know what textiles were produced? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> um, we do. I, I can't. I, I can't think. I, I can't. I, I'm not a textile expert, but I think there's two things. There's 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 large quantities of different types of textiles, and the other thing I know is that there, we also were getting materials sh uh, shipped from Egypt to Ramla for processing. So we, we we also have we also have the thing that not the, the the entire production was was spread out over large distances. So that's kind of, so I think Ramla was more, as far as I understand it, Ramla was more specialized in, in the coloring and the dyeing of textiles and the actual production. So textiles would come in from other places and be, be dyed there. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I should, yeah, I should just say I'd recommend the Geniza documents. They provide like, copious information about, yeah. uh, about the textiles, yeah. And you've been very um, fastidious in, um, in crediting sort of all the many people, including one of, including Dr. Maha, who's here today, who contributed to the, yes. this study and that it is a, a very much a, a, team, a team effort. And I'd like to thank you very much for the overview and, and uh, and congratulations on the publication <laughs> to you and the and the authors, <laughs> and to thank very much our our uh, our um, commentators, our discussants here, Dr. Richard McClary and uh, and Dr. Maha Abu Munsha for their contributions uh, this evening, and really to say thank you to all of you, the audience who have uh, have stayed with us and uh, your interest in CBRL webinars. Um, and this one, particularly this evening, uh, we, uh, we encourage you to check our website uh, for future webinars and to um, also, if you're not on our, uh, on our mailing list already, to sign up for that. Um, we're a membership organization. We encourage um, membership and, and en engagement with us, reach out to us. Um, and also we welcome suggestions for future lectures. If you would like to, to, to make suggestions um, to us, the, as uh, Andrew has said, the Mamluk um, Jerusalem was a, was a major project of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem. In fact, a major surveys of the city of which um, Ramla um, stemmed um, from it. Uh, I should also say those of you who are perhaps keenly eyed will have seen that we, that CBRL has a new logo that we are oh. <laughs> that we are 
that this is our first public event using our new logo. Um, we can, we'll tell you a bit more about it in our next newsletter on, on, on the website. Um, so uh, it remains really to thank everybody very much for, for staying with us tonight, for joining us, and, um, and to wish you all a very pleasant evening until next time. Goodbye from Aman. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ma-salam. Ma-salam. <laughs> <laughs>